Okay, this is a um, talk that I was, or workshop that I was going to run at uh, GitLab Contribute 2020 on uh, array programming and the J language in particular. But uh, unfortunately, I didn't get enough upvotes to be selected for the program, so I decided to move it to a remote talk instead. Um, I'm Sean McGiven. I'm a backend engineer at GitLab. Um, I don't have any particular expertise in this. I've just been playing around with it for a couple of months, and I thought it was kind of fun and interesting, so I wanted to share it with some other people. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, I talk a lot, <laughs> um, so brevity isn't to be expected from me. Um, but uh, you know, the array programming as a sort of concept, and the way I'm defining it in this talk, is like basically sort of the lineage of programming languages from APL, and those tend to have extremely short programs um, for a few reasons. Sometimes people might say it's unreadable but you know clearly people are able to do productive work in these languages as well so i think it's interesting to sort of tease out why that might be what might work in other languages what might not work in other languages and sort of um you know engage with it rather than just rejecting it um out of hand um so i'm going to talk a bit about like what array programming is as i see it and again i'm not an expert and then we'll do a quick um j tutorial um I am not going to end up this workshop with a suggestion that you write any actual application in J um, because I don't know why you would necessarily want to do that, but I don't think all programming necessarily needs to be for applications um, as such. So, oh yeah, and then why? <laughs> um, so, you know, I find this fun. Um, we had an intro um, before the recording started um, with the people on the call and most of them indicated the same, that like, you know, it's just fun to learn about different ways of programming different languages and stuff. Um, and there are sort of three intermingling concerns that I find interesting about um, array programming. So I'll start with the bottom one because I actually think that's the most important one and I'll go into that a bit more later. So there's a strong focus on new notation. Um, and that sort of comes from sort of a mathematical um, background. So like if you think a lot of the things here will probably make more sense if you think of them in a mathematical notation sense than if you do in a sort of traditional um, programming language sense, perhaps. Um, that means that everything, and sorry, obviously the other thing is I'm calling these array programming languages. That means that everything is an array. Um, so you might say, you know, in Ruby, everything's an object. So like, you know, you can, you can try and call methods on nil and they will blow up, but you can at least like, it's valid to try that. Um, in this, everything is an array. And that means multi-dimensional multi array. Um, so, from the notation, um, because it's coming from mathematics, like, you know, there are operations defined on matrices, for instance, which are two dimensional arrays. Um, so there's automatic application of um, different functions and operators to different types, different uh, dimensionalities of array, what I've called shapes here for reasons that will become clear later. And that means that um, a lot of things become more natural because you don't have to think, is this like a Two dimensional array, is it a three dimensional array? Is it you know a list, a one dimensional array? Like you can you can apply the same thing and explore um, more easily. Um, in historical terms, these papers are already worth reading. Um, in particular, the second one, notation as a tool of thought. So I mentioned notation before. This is um, I think a Turing Award winning paper or something like that uh, by Kenneth Everson, um, who um, created APL. Um, and that to paper basically introduces APL by sort of talking through, um, I think the title is actually a great title because it really, really captures the essence of the paper, which is like, if you are trying to use notation to help you think, then what would that notation look like? And the problems Kenneth Everson is looking at solving, are, you know, mostly mathematical problems which is why the notation looks like it does because it comes from mathematics and um you know is influenced by it but um and i will do a 
terrible job of summarizing it, so please just read the paper. But the basic idea is that there's this tension between computer programming languages, which have notation, but the notation is designed for a computer to interpret, and mathematical notation, which is quite natural in a lot of cases and you know quite concise, but is also not possible for a computer to interpret it. So you can think about it as an attempt to create an executable mathematical notation. Um, and that might be the the easiest way in, I guess. Um, so don't worry, um, like I study mathematics. I'm not great at mathematics anymore because I don't have to use it <laughs> most of the time. So you don't need to um, you don't need to know uh, mathematical concepts like to learn these languages. I'm just talking about this in a sort of background sense. Um, so let's take a look at some APL. Um, this is a classic video. You may have already seen it. Um, this is the game of life, which is um, uh, hopefully everybody knows what that is, but if not, it's a game where um, from John Conway um, on numbers and games is a really good book, actually, just while I'm uh, on the John Conway subject, um, where you take the number of neighbors of a given cell on a map like this, and depending on how many neighbors there are, a cell can either grow, um, die, or like remain. So, like the ones are cells here that are live and you can see the sort of um, first four iterations of a game of life here so this is the full implementation in um, dialogue apl later in the video there's a couple more lines to make the outputs um, not use ones and zeros but this is this is basically it um, i'm not going to talk through it all because i don't really i'm not very good at apl but i can talk through the first couple of bits just to give you some foreshadowing for later on when we start talking about J. So we start with the first nine integers, which is what this, um, not very good at Greek letters either, but I think that's iota. Um, so this is the first nine integers. Um, we reshape those, so that, that will give you an array um, or a list, uh, sorry, a one-dimensional array or a list. So just the first nine integers as an array. Reshape that into a three by three um, matrix or table or two-dimensional array. Take the positions of the integers two, three, four, five, and eight. Um, so when you say take the positions in these languages, Booleans are normally zero or one. So this isn't two, three, four, five, and eight because this is the first iteration after that. But this would be if you took the positions of one, two, three, four, seven, and eight um, in this one. Uh, then we next um, move that into a five by seven matrix to give the padding around the edge and um, shift that two horizontally and one vertically to center it. Um, and then here is the actual sort of application of life. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail there. Like I said, important things to note here in APL, um, the curly braces mean a function and the omega is the argument to that function. So you don't name the argument, you just get given um, you can just use omega in there. And then we'll see this a lot later. So this is a common pattern to all the languages. Um, plus slash basically means sum. Um, it's two characters, it's plus and slash. It's not a single um, operator, so it's more general. But um, yeah, so this is summing um, twice, um, which I'll go into in a bit more detail later. But that's what APL looks like. and. One of the issues I think people had with APL is that um, it's got a different character set. <laughs> like it's hard to type. Um, there were special, I, I believe, special APL keyboards. Now you can type it in, you know, using regular keyboards easily. But um, I think that was kind of a, a barrier to adoption. So in the family tree, there are kind of these parallel um, lineages, and they're both ASCII-based. So K. I'm going to start at the bottom again. K and Q come from, I think, something called A+. plus. So these come out of like um, banking, investment banking. Um, and these were created by Arthur Whitney, um, who um, worked with Kenneth Everson um, when he was younger. Um, these are commercial languages. There are some open source variants of K um, written by other people. But for the most part, they are languages you have to pay to use, which is why I started with J. Um, they're known for being very fast. Um, you will sometimes see, like, you know, when someone posts like uh, an article, like, um, 
oh, I rewrote the word counting in my favorite language and it's faster than the C version. And then someone posts a Q version that's like one line and they'll say, oh, well, this is actually faster. Um, <laughs> so you'll occasionally see like the one line um, Q and K pop up in comments to articles like that. Um, I don't have a huge amount of knowledge there. I can say that the different versions of K are actually different languages, kind of like Perl. So there's a K5 and a K6 and a K7, and they all have slightly different features. So from what I understand, Arthur Whitney just rewrites the entire language every time there's a new version rather than start from uh, the previous versions. Um, so J is on the other side of things that was created by Kenneth Everson, um, basically after he retired, um, or as he put it, retiring from paid employment. Um, it was initially also a commercial language, but it's been uh, open source since 2011 or dual license since 2011. Um, and the, the big distinction I would say between J and K um, beyond sort of like other design differences is that J's that standard vocabulary, which you can think of as like the standard library, but not exactly, is huge. And K's is much, much smaller. Um, so there's sort of a maximalist, minimalist um, uh, tension between them. I'd say if you can read one, you can probably get a grasp on the other, but there are definitely sort of fundamental things that work differently. and um, from what I've seen, things like defining new functions are much nicer in K than they are in J. Although in J, it's not bad. It's just that K, I think, has a more consistent way of doing that. So um, that's basically all the intro. Um, let's take a look at some J. So at any point from this point, if you have J installed, like feel free to like type this. Um, I also put the um, link to the slides in the invite. So you can just copy and paste it. Like, one of the advantages of these programs being really short is it shouldn't take long to type this um, in a console. So if you've got J installed on um, Mac OS, uh, you can start a J console by typing JCon. Um, and yeah, um, so this is just a quick look at um, what the different parts of the language look like, as well as like what J looks like <laughs> if you haven't seen it before. If you have, then I'm probably going to be explaining some stuff that you already know. So first of all, um, by convention, um, there are three spaces before user input, and then output is unindented. So um, that's kind of backwards to a lot of languages. But again, these have kind of like been their own sort of parallel branch of language design. So they kind of do a few things um, weirdly like that. Um, J also has this thing where it's um, Again, kind of like Perl, actually, it kind of uses linguistic terms for a lot of things. So we don't talk about functions, we talk about verbs, adverbs, um, and conjunctions, um, <laughs> which can be a bit confusing at first, but I found it easier to just stick with the um, official terms rather than try and translate backwards and forwards. Um, so this first line or sentence um, is saying, give us the first 12 positive integers. So like in the APL example at the start, this i dot works like iota did there. Um, it gives a sequence of 12 numbers. Um, this one starts at zero instead of one, so I'm adding one to the sequence. Um, so here, i dot is a verb that takes one argument, which is 12, plus is a verb that takes two arguments, which is one and i dot 12, um, equals colon is a fairly obviously an assignment, um, <laughs> hopefully. Um, equals dot is local, but for this, we're just going to use global assignment, so you don't really need to worry about that. Um, this is a verb which we'll go into later, but basically it just means display the output. Um, so that gives us the first 12 numbers. Um, in the second sentence, um, we have a comment which starts with NB. Again, it's like parallel <laughs> evolution of programming languages, but also when you see the standard vocabulary, you realize that basically every um, every non-letter or number, every non-alphanumeric symbol on the keyboard is already taken to mean something else. So you kind of have to use something like NB to mean a comment because um, they're all they're all in use otherwise. Um, and so we've, we've, we've given our um, list the name of A, um, plus slash means the sum. Um, here, plus, is a verb like the verb here that takes two arguments, one on the left, one on the right. And slash is an adverb that makes it possible to apply that 
over the entire array. And that you can think of that as like reduce, um, but we'll go into that in a bit more in a second. Um, so that's the sum of the array. And then this um, will make sense is the mean. So it's the sum divided by the count of the array. Um, and uh, that's a fork, um, which is one of the things that J has that I don't think K has, but is quite interesting, um, but not necessarily generalizable. <laughs> um, but yeah, all of these are words. Um, words make a sentence. Um, like I said, J refers to these as parts of speech. So the J wiki is like generally the best place to learn about stuff. And it will, it has quite a big sort of parts of speech section where it talks about the uh, intricacies of each of these. Um, I'm just going to take a second to drink some water, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to speak up or ask in the chat. Yeah, sorry, I, I missed. What, what, can you say again? What is the what is the square bracket verb? What does that do exactly? I'll go onto that on the next slide. Um, oh, okay. But yes, that's a good question because it's it's kind of mysterious there. Uh, oh, sorry, it's not on the next slide. It must be on the slide after. <laughs> so this is just walking through some other stuff. So um, I will get to that though. I promise, Matthias. <laughs> So just uh, repeating the first sentence from the previous um, slide. Um, some things to note here, the, there is no operator precedence. Um, like if you try, um, what's a good example? Uh, two times three plus one um, in your console, um, that, will not, um, that will not give you seven, that will give you uh, eight, um, if I can do maths in my head correctly. Um, because it's the three plus one is on the right hand side, so that gets evaluated first, then uh, multiplied by two. So any um, any change to the default uh, execution order, you can use parentheses. Um, there are also a couple of other tricks you can use, but I'm not going to use them here because they, there's already plenty to go through. <laughs> um, so, like I said before, um, i.12 is the first 12. Uh, integers starting at zero, so the first of all, non-negative integers. So we add one to that and we get one based. Um, then we get into some of the stuff I was talking about um, initially. So you can add i.12 to i.12 and you can get the first um, 12 even numbers if you count zero um, as one of them. And what that does, as you can you can probably guess, is add them pairwise. So it adds one to one, uh, sorry, zero to zero, one to one, two to two, um, et cetera. And like I said, because there's no precedence, I have to put braces around here because otherwise this would be uh, i dot 12 plus 12 and then i dot, but i dot doesn't take, um, the result of that would be a list and i dot doesn't take a list. So you would get an error. Um, so that's why I had to put parentheses around this side, but not around this side. Um, obviously this works with other um, things as well. So you could do the same thing by just multiplying by two. So something I wanted to call out here because it, it might be obvious and it might not is here I've added a single atom one to a list 12 and it adds that atom to every item in the list. Here I've added a list of length 12 to a list of length 12 and it adds the items pairwise. So at the start when I was talking about automatic application, this is the kind of thing I meant, like hopefully both of these are fairly obvious when you read them, but if you think about them in terms of other programming languages, that might not actually be how you do this, those two operations because they're different things. If you're used to thinking about arrays as like things that you need to unpack and manually like loop over. Um, or manually do some operation on, even if you've got higher order, um, even if you've got like, you know, convenient uh, facilities for like, you know, reducing and folding over arrays, you might not have that quite look the same way. Um, so what does anybody think adding an array of one length to an array of a different length would do? So this is an atom rather than an array. Um, added to an array. This is an array of length 12 added to a length of array, to, an array of length 12. Um, you could try that out in your console and tell me what it says as well if you want.
anyone want to speak up? Otherwise, I'll pick somebody. Yeah, it's in, in, in middle length errors. So I guess it, it's doing like uh, matrix operations, like when you don't have the same dimensions, it will fail. Yeah, exactly right, Sebastian. So Jay's error messages are terrible, I should say. Length error is one of the errors you will get. Like domain error is another one, but like basically they're, they're they're not very helpful. <laughs> this one, this one isn't too bad because I sort of like led into like what the issue would be, but it can be like quite hard to figure out what's going on. Um, so yeah, because the dimensions don't match in any way, um, there's no sort of sensible option for J to pick as a default here. So it just sort of goes with, um, you know, saying that's not possible. <laughs> Oops, sorry, so, go ahead. As an observation, mm -hmm. the third line of code there, one plus i dot 12, mm -hmm. that's technically adding a list of one value to a list of 12, right? Uh, yes, if everything is an array, but I slightly oversimplified at the start. So atoms are not arrays. So like a single mm -hmm. number, um, you can have a single element list with a single number in it, but by default, it's not an array. It's, um, it's, it's still an atomic thing all of its own. Um, so for instance, uh, let me just uh, type this up. So if you type um, $1.1 one, uh, in your console, you will get one, but that will be a list of length one. So if you then type parentheses one dollar one plus i dot twelve you will get a length error because then you're trying to add a list of length one to a list of length twelve um so yeah thanks for calling that out ben i did definitely um oversimplify that part so um while almost everything is an array there are atomic types um that aren't um and uh you can think of those as an array with dimension zero, which is the way Jay sometimes puts it, um, and might help um, later on. Um, so some languages, a Monad tutorial takes like a whole blog post. Um, this one, uh, it's got its own definitions for things because it means, you know, it's, it's parallel evolution again. Um, so verb is, you can think of as a function. Um, they only take a maximum of two arguments, one on the left, one on the right, but the arguments can obviously be arrays. Um, and a monad is just a verb that only has a right argument. So sometimes I might say monadic or dyadic here. I will try not to because um, they're not sort of natural terms. But if I do, what I mean by monadic is we're only using the right-hand argument, which is by convention called Y, like in the APL example, it was called Omega. And then a dyad has a left and a right argument. So in our, um previous example um times and plus are being used dyadically because they have a left and right argument and i dot is being used monadically because it just has a right argument so that's the monad tutorial done um, <laughs> um getting back to the, the right uh, square bracket that matthias asked about earlier um so by default assignment doesn't display the value but it does turn the value, which is a little bit confusing. Um, right square brace is basically um, an identity verb. Um, the, also left square brace does the same thing. Um, in this case, um, they have another use, but that's kind of out of scope um, for what I'm talking about here. Um, but here's a few examples of just like um, what's happening with um, uh, in a console session when you use or don't use um, the right square brace. So um, when you see that, it doesn't, it doesn't really mean anything except show what I've assigned. Um, and um, I meant to put something on here about global and local assignment, but then I got rid of it because we don't need lo uh, local assignment at all for what we're doing here. Um, so yeah, I talked a bit about the verbs. So we had I dot plus uh, multiply. Um, an adverb, as you might expect from the name, is like a higher order function. So it's a it's a verb that operates on a verb rather than on a noun. Um, so slash is the one I mentioned earlier. Um, it works kind of like reduce. Um, so 
plus slash is the sum, uh, star slash is the product. Um, in this case, um, right angle brackets and dot is uh, the greatest of the two arguments. So obviously this just gives you the last um, uh, argument. The way it works, so it's actually called in J terms, it's called insert um, rather than reduce. And the reason is it inserts the verb between every item. So you can think of plus slash as putting a plus here, a plus here, a plus here, a plus here, etc. cetera. Um, because sometimes that can, I don't know, when I think of it as reduce, I sometimes get that a bit wrong. And when I think of it as insert, that normally helps me like when I've made a mistake doing that basically. Um, so um, I'm not sure if there is actually any formal difference that just sometimes helps me um, when I've gone wrong. Um, so, so far we've been looking at single dimensional arrays, just a list, um, but now we can look at tables as well or matrices. So I mentioned shape earlier. Shape is just the dimensions of um, an array. So um, I.12 has shape 12 because it's a one dimensional array with 12 items. Um, here we're using dollar, um, which I mentioned earlier to like turn a, a one into a list just containing one um, to reshape um, a noun. So three, four means a three by four um, table. Um, dollar A obviously um, reshapes A into a three by four table. Um, and yeah, so each of the numbers is an atom, so they can't be reshaped because they have no shape. Um, but any array or list has a shape. And this is what we mean when we say the shape of a list, uh, sorry, of an array. List just means one dimensional array, um, getting my terms mixed up. So plus slash also works here um, and it gives column sums. So one plus five plus nine is 15, two plus six plus 10 is 18, et cetera. Um, and that just works automatically, like I said. Um, so you can just sort of sum anything and like it will, it will give you the right shape of result compared to the shape of what you put in. That won't always work, but for most verbs, J can automatically apply it to the right um, level, I guess, or the right dimensions of the objects, the array that you're, you're doing the verb on. Um, I'm going to take another drink for a second. Sorry, my voice is getting a bit croaky, but if anybody has any questions, that's another good jumping in point. I'll make an observation. So I, I decided to play around with the code you've got there and defined mm -hmm. a four by five array. Mm -hmm. And what it did was populate it. It basically looped. Yes, that's a really good observation. Thank you for that, Ben. So yeah, maybe just try um, four space five dollar a or four space five dollar i dot twelve or whatever um, in your console. Because um, yeah, Ben, do you want to talk about that a bit more? Um, yeah, I was just curious how it would handle defining an array. Uh, in that fashion, what would it do with the, the the values that you haven't effectively supplied values for? Would it mm -hmm. populate them as zeros or nulls, or what would it do? It turns out it loops. So. Yeah, so yeah, it just it just wraps around. So mm. it doesn't use any knowledge that it's i dot twelve. It just starts from the beginning again. And similarly, if you did like three by three, um, hopefully that would be more um, obvious anyway. But if you did three by three, you would just lose the last um, four items. Uh, three items can't count um, because yeah so yeah that's that's a good observation so reshaping um, automatically keeps filling whatever you're reshaping to make up the new shape you can't have um, you can't really have nulls um, it could fill with zeros um, but I think I don't know the exact reason for this but I think because it could also be like a string that you're reshaping potentially um, it does it just by starting from the start, because obviously a string you can think of as an array of characters. So zeros wouldn't necessarily make sense there. Um, actually on that topic, um, one thing I forgot to mention um, was that um, arrays in J have to be 
uh, have to all have the same type. You can't put a string in an array with a number. Um, or you can, but you have to then what's called box the, the um, atoms, which I won't go into in this talk because it's a bit more um, involved than we need to get into. But like you can basically think that as like you know boxing in Java or whatever, like where instead of a primitive type, you have a, an object wrapper. Um, but on that string topic, if you type um, three space three dollar and then hello in single quotes, you can see what happens if you put a string into reshape as well. Um, which does the the same thing of um, starting from uh, from the start of the array and just looping. So um, that gives you column sums. What if you wanted row sums? Um, well, sort of one obvious answer is you could transpose the table. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily know that uh, pipe colon is transpose, but if you try pipe colon y, you will see that it is. <laughs> um, and then if you sum that, obviously you'll get the um, column sums of the transposed table, which is the row sums of the original table. Um, and then operate on the one cells with explicit rank. Now I say that out loud, I realize that that's quite a, there's quite a lot in that sentence to unpack. <laughs> um, so hopefully I can get this across. So, um, yeah, let's go on to the next slide. <laughs> there is this conjunction double quote. Um, so a conjunction is like an adverb, but it's dyadic. Um, I think I'm right in saying so like an adverb just has one argument, a conjunction has two. Um, they're both called modifiers in the more general sense. I might have that definition wrong, by the way, don't don't trust it. Um, and so the rank of an operation is the, actually, sorry, let me go back a second. The rank is the length of the list of the shape. So an atom has rank zero. Like I said, it's, it's zero dimensional. Um, A, has rank one because its shape is just 12. B has rank, oh, sorry, I, I renamed these from B to Y, uh, sorry, from Y to B, but I missed these two for those are supposed to be Bs there. Um, B has rank two because the length of three, four is two. Um, so does that make sense? So like the shape is the exact dimensions of, um, an array and the rank is just what the dimensionality of an array is. So this is a two dimensional array. So it has rank two. Um, an atom is not an array. So it has rank zero. Um, so this makes some have rank one. So it makes it operate on the one cells or the one dimensional arrays within B. And by default, it has infinite rank. So it just goes as high as it can and then takes the, the highest order of thing it can slice up and sums those. Um, there's this uh, thing you can use B dot. So if you do plus slash B dot <laughs> zero, you will get a list of ranks. They will all be underscore. Um, so what that's saying is underscore is infinity. And it's saying that the monadic rank is infinity and the dyadic rank is infinity on the left and infinity on the right. So that's why there's three underscores. So saying that out loud, you know, it is super terse, but once, once you know what that means, it's not too bad, I promise. <laughs> so, Hopefully the next slide will, will help clarify that a bit more. So yeah, so plus slash B, uh, well, maybe I've got these the wrong way around actually. No, uh, I mean, sorry, let me just check. Sorry, yes. So uh, column sums, row sums. Column sums work like plus slash the list of the first row plus the list of the second, followed by the list of the second row, followed by the list of the third row. Um, the way you construct an array in J is just by adding spaces. The way you 
combined to arrays is with the comma. The reason I have the comma colon here is because I need a particular shape of output array. Um, you don't really need to worry about that, but basically this is how you, how you compose things. Um, so plus slash by default, if we go back to what B looks like, is this plus this plus this, which like we said before, operates pairwise. So it's this plus this plus this, this plus this plus this, and so on. With the rank of one, it inserts the plus slash at a different point. So it puts it inside each, or outside, sorry, each row. Um, so instead of saying like add the first row to the second row, it says sum the first row, sum the second row, sum the third row. Um, so in retrospect, that's quite a confusing slide. Does anybody have any questions about that? I gotta try it out first. So I was gonna write out like, cause you know, I said like plus slash, like inserts the plus. I was gonna write it out with the pluses, but then it got very, very long, even with such a short example. So I didn't do that. Um, yeah. I'm just going to talk a bit more about these bottom two things. So you can try out these um, other options down here. Um, I'm curious about um, uh, what you expect them to do. Um, but hopefully the results will make sense as you try them. Um, so if you try with rank um, zero, you would be saying, I want this to operate on individual atoms. And that basically gives you the array back because like, you're not adding the individual atom to anything. You're just saying like, um, you're, you're applying a uh, monadic plus to each individual atom. So it's the same as saying like, when you have one, it's the same as saying plus one. Um, which is one, <laughs> uh, unsurprisingly. Um, for two and three, um, obviously this isn't a three-dimensional array. Because the rank of sum is infinite by default, they just work the same as, as what it would be anyway. It's just saying like apply it on the highest order of thing you can. Um, so I think there's a case for saying that with rank three, it should be an error because the, the actual um, array doesn't have rank three, but I think hopefully the answer to that is fairly natural. It's just saying like, put it as far outside of, of the array as you can and um, work with what you've got. Um, I'll give you another couple of seconds to sort of work through and digest that. <laughs> Um, so really the point here as well is that you can set an explicit rank with this uh, double quote conjunction. So you can say, I want sum to be of rank one, but by default, every verb has a rank and also every array has a rank. So Jay can use those two ranks to figure out what sum of a matrix means or what sum of a three-dimensional array means, because it can use the two ranks and um, apply it to the correct size of what we call cell. Um, so um, the, uh, like I said, the one cells are the um, arrays of rank one within the array of rank two, so they're the rows. Um, so does that make sense? So rank zero, just returns all the individual atoms. Mm -hmm. Rank one adds the rows. Yes, because they are the one cells. So they are the one dimensional arrays that make up the two dimensional array. Uh, okay, rank, rank two adds the columns. Mm -hmm. Rank three, then appears to be adding the columns, but would do it across the three dimensions. Yeah, so if this was a three dimensional array, these would work differently, but because it's not, like there is no rank three to operate on, so it's already as far, like you can't put 
some any further outside of this it's already on the on the outside so um it's it's already um uh so it's, it's, it's already operating at the maximum sort of like <laughs> distance it can if that makes sense maybe i'm understanding it well but for example when you try to what is the word for that reshape they're like a into like three four one uh, array it will like the shape change and then the the ransoms make sense again like if you keep reshaping it with the adding the extra dimension as a one level the way in which it's it's reshaped it make makes sense the i don't know the rank operations of the sum again uh sorry so, say that again sebastian so you're saying if you reshape a to be a three-dimensional um yes into three for one if mm -hmm. you shake how it's reshaped then the rank sum makes sense again yes like, like you don't need to like imagine that you are like just keeping the same values before just it's more how you reshape it that or how the shaping makes sense for the new operation i think it's something like that but i'm not sure i'm just curious about it yeah so the, the way i think about rank is that it's like something any language could implement but most languages don't because arrays aren't um arrays don't work like that basically like you know nobody expects um like if, if you have a two-dimensional array in ruby and you call um some on it like i don't think anybody expects that to do anything in particular um but because like the focus is on notation like something should be sort of well defined across any dimension of array because if you were writing it down like you wouldn't want to write down some as a different thing for each um each shape of array like potentially you would what you would want some to like do a sensible thing for each one and the, the sensible thing here is to look at the ranks of the verb and look at the rank of the arguments to the verb and apply to the correct cell size of the two so when i talked about automatic application at the start this is kind of what i meant like you have a rank for your function and you have a rank for your input to the function and you find the common um, shape and rank of thing between those two and you apply it to those two and then you get the results um, depending on what those are applied to so if you want the total sum of um, the uh, um, the first 12 integers, um, you would do plus slash plus slash B, right? Um, because that's summing the results. And then whichever, you know, summing these is the same as summing these. Um, so, yeah. Does that, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I might not have explained that well. So I've, I've just created myself a three-dimensional array, and I'm trying those, and that that's when things get more interesting. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, you, so yeah, please please play around with this stuff. Like, I'm, yeah, ho hopefully, um, I don't think it's possible to like understand this just by reading it. <laughs> Basically, um, I think you do have to sort of play around with it and try things out. So please please do that. Um, okay, so time-wise, I probably need to be moving on. Um, so I mentioned conjunctions before, so uh, yeah. Oh, okay, right, I probably was right. Um, conjunction is a modifier that takes two arguments as opposed to one. Um, for an adverb, um, it takes one argument that has to be a verb. Um, for a conjunction, it doesn't because you can see here that one is not a verb, um, it's um, an atom, but this is a verb. So, um i mentioned earlier about the right to left thing that doesn't 100 percent apply with conjunctions and i'm not going to go 100 percent into it here <laughs> but basically it does what makes most sense conventionally so here this is evaluated oops sorry this is evaluated first so we first of all apply um we get plus insert sum then the um rank conjunction is applied to sum and one so it gives you the um the sum with rank one um 
plus colon is double. I'm just showing that here. Um, right angle brace colon is increments. I'm just showing that here. So you can increment by like obviously just applying one after the other. Um, here I'm doing one with a conjunction, which is at. I said it works like compose. That's actually wrong. <laughs> um, it does kind of work like compose, but the closer one to like a sort of traditional compose function is at colon. Um, and you'll see that there are a lot of these sort of um, digraphs. So like a lot of verbs that are one character by default, like plus and slash. Um, and then there are some that are two, like plus colon and um, angle brackets colon. There is logic in the way they are put together, but I'm not equipped to describe that logic. So I will just say you have to just sort of get a sense for what makes sense and what doesn't. Um, uh, but yeah, so this isn't very interesting because it does the same thing um, as just applying them one after the other. The interesting thing you can think about is like, well, what if I wanted to like assign this to something or put it somewhere else, like where I didn't immediately have the the thing on the right hand side that I wanted to apply it to, but I just wanted a single verb that does both um, for some reason, then that's where you would use um, composition like you would in any other language where you would compose two functions. Um, right, so this is the other big, there's a few big complicated things. This is the other one. So if you have two verbs next to each other, they will compose themselves automatically according to these two rules. And as far as I'm aware, this is just in J. And um, uh, you know, I'm not 100% sure how useful this is, but it does lead to some, some nice um, approaches. So there's, um, I think this actually might, yeah, this links to the paper. Um, about the hooks and forks that Kenneth Everson wrote. So you can read that at your leisure at some point. So here, these are verbs and X's and Y's are um, for the monadic and dyadic cases, like I mentioned earlier. So yeah, these are the shapes they take. I'm not gonna go through all of them because you can read. Um, what I will say is that if you remember when I talked about the mean earlier, so we had sum divided by total of a list. So we would have the sum of the list divided by the total of the list. Um, and that's why that works, because it's a fork. And these show up in a bunch of places and sort of idiomatic J uses them quite a lot. The fortunate slash unfortunate thing is that if you put say four verbs in um, a row, you would this would still work. You would get, and I always forget which way around it is, you would either get a fork where the this one is the hook from here or the other way around like i can't remember i can never remember which way it consumes those uh to construct this trade but because this is just constructing a new verb um that works like this um and this is just constructing a new verb that works like this you can think of them as just ways of constructing verbs um without using explicit composition operators um, but it can be very confusing when you read something. Um, and this is a thing that made me think about syntax highlighting um, just in general, because in J, syntax highlighting, you know, built in like words isn't super useful. If there was a way syntax highlighting could highlight what's a hook, what's a fork, what's connected to what, like what's composing automatically in that way that would actually be really useful. Um, and I think there are some tools in J to do that, but they're not so much syntax highlighting as they'll draw you like a tree of the um, evaluation um, that's happening here. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide because this is a thing that I think is useful to know, but I don't think we can really get into the weeds on. Um, but we can show the, the mean again, um, just explicitly, like I said. Um, one other thing I should mention here is, obviously because of the order of operations, um, I have to put this in parentheses, but if you take this and just assign it to something like, I don't know, mean. So if you type mean equals colon and then put in plus slash um, percent uh, hash sign, um, if you then do mean a, it will just work. Um, so we didn't really cover like constructing your own verbs, but that's one way you can quite easily construct your own verb. And probably the easiest way to make it clear to somebody that this is a fork is to just um assign the verb the fork to something without 
any nouns involved because then it's obvious to somebody that this has to be a composition of functions. And in general, J style goes for what's called tacit style. So when you construct verbs, you don't generally use explicit arguments if possible. You just construct forks and compositions and hooks that know where their arguments are and insert them in the right places. Kind of like in Haskell, they have what's called points freestyle, where you define functions without actually defining the, without actually naming the arguments at all, because they're just compositions of other functions. Um, so that's why you might use this, but I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't really have time to like talk too much about that. Uh, I did want to talk a bit about the vocabulary because if you want to go forward, um, this is going to be very useful. So first of all, I'm just going to do an unfair, deliberately unfair comparison between the J vocabulary and the K vocabulary. So this is the J vocabulary. Um, these are all the standard words that you need to know. As you can see, there are you know plenty. Uh, this is the J vocabulary, uh, K vocabulary. That's it. There's 20 primitives, six operators slash adverbs, and three system functions. Uh, which, which sort of indicates the difference in style between Arthur Whitney and Kenneth Everson. Um, right, so the way to read this really quickly, I'm not expecting you to remember all this, but just so you know, so it's got a key up here. So purples are verbs, blues are adverbs, greens are conjunctions, um, nouns, so it's just got the infinity indeterminate ones just there for use. Um, copulas are just the two assignment operators that I mentioned. Way down here, we do have explicit control flow. Um, but again, good style is to not really use these, which is probably why they're in red and at the bottom. Um, then here, so we have, uh, let's, that's a good example. Um, right, so uh, minus probably works like you'd expect. So if you give it one argument, that argument has, so if you're in the monadic case, it has rank zero and it works as negate. If you give it two arguments, uh, and it's dyadic, both arguments have rank zero and it works as minus. So that's what this is saying. So it's giving you the monadic case and the dyadic case. Um, not all of them have both and not all of them have the same rank for both. Um, so for instance, uh, shape, um, which we, we did earlier, so that's what I called reshape. Um, the left argument has to have rank one because a shape is a list of dimensions. Like you can't have a two dimensional list of dimensions. That doesn't make sense. And the right argument has rank infinity because it can be anything. Um, and then to get the shape of something, you obviously just pass one thing which can have um, any rank. Uh, things like nub, um, which just means the unique items in a list um, just have a monadic form. Uh, yeah. Uh, things are grouped and there is sort of some logic. So you can see here, you've got less than, um, then you've got less the minimum of like with a dot, and then you've got less than or equal to with a colon. Um, and similarly, um, that's decrement and increment in the monadic form. So like the dots and colons like generally follow down here. So like you'd have hash, hash dot, hash colon, and they generally relate in some way. Um, Another example is um, here, uh, left curly brace dot is the head and left curly brace colon is the tail. Um, so like, they do relate, it's just not immediately obvious and you, you just do have to like read them and like learn it. Um, down here are a bunch of the composition um, conjunctions. Um, so yeah, earlier I mentioned at and this one's actually called at, but it's at colon. And this one's called the top and it's at, which I always find quite confusing when I'm trying to like do my internal monologue um, to like work out what something means. So um, a couple of other verbs here. So alphabet is all of the ASCII bytes um, and that's a boxed empty list, which is useful for some things, but we don't need to go into. So those, those are two nouns you can see there, but most of these are gonna be verbs, adverbs and um, conjunctions. Right. Sorry, I realize I'm out of time, but I'm gonna keep going for a little bit if that's okay. <laughs> so one thing you might be wondering is why wouldn't I just name these things like they're named on here? So instead of using um, plus slash, I might say sum equals colon plus slash. And there are a couple of answers to that. First of all, with the focus on notation, the idea is that you shouldn't need that. I think that's debatable, but that's the idea. Um, like, because if you see plus slash, 
you immediately know that that means some. And like when I was doing the APL earlier, I don't really understand APL, but I know immediately that that means some because it means some in APL, it means some in K, and it means some in J. Um, not everything applies across all those languages, but like the idea is that you can spot common patterns more easily if the notation is shorter and if the notation is consistent. Um, the other reason is that it actually impacts performance. So you can create a table with a million random numbers. So a thousand by a thousand table um, with a million random numbers between one and zero using this. And this looks quite complicated, but it, will, it, it just takes a sentence as a string and it will tell you the time and space usage of that string. Um, so if you want to sum the table, you can do plus slash plus slash, or you can do um, this, which is um, plus slash composed with uh, comma, which just means like unravel, uh, or I think it means ravel because ravel and unravel mean the same thing. Um, but like basically means like flatten out that table. Um, so some of the flattened table is what you can read this as. And again, feel free to try this out locally. Um, but if you do it using the initial, like just the, the standard um, vocabulary, it's faster and uses less space than it is if you do it this way. And the reason is that there are these special combinations, which are like um, fast paths in the interpreter that recognize specific patterns and optimize for those. And those optimizations don't work across um, like aliasing like this. I think it's probably possible that they could, but I don't know enough about it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a secondary reason. I think the better reason is just like, because the point of the language is to like, you know, part of the point of the language is the notation, but a secondary reason for using the notation is that it is actually faster. Um, the other thing here is this f dot um, adverb. So what this can do is this can take our names and it's called fix. It converts them into like the canonical form. So if you want to build up something, you know, just sort of exploring and then like get it back into like what it would be if you hadn't used your own names, you can use that. And you can see here that with the fixed version, it's basically the same speed. It's actually slightly faster, but that's probably a measurement error. It does use a lot more space. Um, again, if you try this out locally, just with um, without the C on the end, the space is mostly used in actually figuring out what the sentence is, um, rather than summing things. So it takes more sense, more space to sum. Uh, sorry, to fix that sentence into like canonical form than it does to sum the items in the list. Um, Sorry, I really had to run through that slide because uh, I was out of time. But hopefully, hopefully you'll maybe remember that in future, <laughs> even if you don't remember the details. Um, and yeah, that's all I've got. Um, the next two slides are just a bunch of links if you want to learn more stuff. Um, there's a bunch of um, J stuff there, um, and then some K stuff, and then there's this site um, nsl.com, which stands for no stinking loops. So the idea is that like when you're programming with arrays, you shouldn't need explicit loops. You should. Yeah, I had meant to ask about list because you know list programming. I was sort of expecting that it might be kind of similar, but it's still quite different, right? Mm. Um, I, I, I have no put, experience in list closure, but okay. Yeah, I put different. a link in. Um, so I created an array programming channel on Slack, which would probably be quite a quiet channel, but you know I thought it might be useful for this. This, this basically. Um, so K has a comparison with Lisp here, which is sort of like um, uh, in Arthur Whitney's typically terse style. <laughs> um, but um, the main difference you can think about is that um, the shape of the things that you are, the actual formatting of the source code. So like these languages aren't homo iconic, like they, they aren't like all in the same um, S expressions. J, uh, K does use M expressions, um, like Mathematica, but J doesn't. Um, and um, yeah, this is quite fun to read through and try and interpret <laughs> because like there's not a lot there, but like, you know, each line's kind of worth thinking about. Um, 
there is also a paper I posted, which I didn't include here for some reason, um, which is um, someone who works on Dialog APL wrote a paper about like automatic, automatically applying um, functions like I talked about here, um, but use like a list like syntax to demonstrate that in a paper so as to avoid like, um, like I guess scaring people off with J or K or APL. Um, and it's quite interesting to sort of read through that and like see what that would look like in a list because the nice thing about lists is even if you don't really use them you can probably kind of read them because there's there's no syntax <laughs> so like you, you get a reasonable sense of what's going on um but yeah there's, there's a bunch of stuff here um one thing i found quite fun last year was sort of going through advent of code in this because advent of code was basically last year was like there were some problems that were working on this int code machine that they defined um and they were like every second day and then the problems the other days were like all basically perfect for array programming they were things like make a game of life with these properties or um you know do some trigonometry with these things and they're all like ideal for array programming um so a lot of the solutions were quite short um in that and quite satisfying to work on so i think that's a fun thing to to maybe do later this year as well um okay cool i'll stop recording um does anybody have uh, sorry i'll stop sharing does anybody have any other questions? Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for your time, everybody. Um, I really appreciated the chance to talk um, about this at you. And um, yeah, I'll post this on YouTube as well if anybody else is interested. And uh, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, thanks so much. Thanks. That's great. Thanks a lot. That's really cool. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.